and we're now broadcasting and uh, it takes a few minutes for folks to come through and uh, um, we are broadcasting. Excellent, accurate. I can see some folks bleeding in. So, all right, it's November 10th. It's almost Christmas. It's crazy. This year is going so fast. Oh my God. Um, I'm so excited. Uh, today, the weather has been beautiful. We have actually 81 degrees and uh, a little bit of breeze and a uh, fantastic day. We have a great guest. But before we get rolling, John and Sibley Butler, would you like to start us with some music theme? Sure. Once I live the life of a millionaire, spending my money. I really didn't care. Took Llewellyn King out to have a good time. I bought him champagne and bourbon, beer and wine. But then I began to fall down low. I didn't have a cent or any friends where to go. It's mighty strange, but without a doubt, Nobody knows you when you're down and out. All right. All right. This is your own vintage, huh? How are you doing, Johnny? I'm doing fine. We have a great day in Austin, Texas. The, the weather is, 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 is very, very good. The news is uh, very, very enlightening with the, the threats to shut down the, <clears throat> the land from Canada, the petroleum line to Canada. Oh. what that would do to the price of things and to the great right. state of Texas and, and all and, and petroleum. I had a great uh, MBA class this morning on uh, technology transfer. Uh, so life is good here in the uh, great state of Texas and uh, the weather is good and the politics is always interesting. <laughs> Absolutely. Llewellyn, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing very well. It's a very beautiful day. Yeah, unfortunately, I have a lot to write and haven't been out in it much. Just got back from Texas, where I said the Edison Electric Institute Financial Conference, which was uh, very pleasant. It was in Hollywood, Florida. Uh, it was both pleasant and I think enlightening. I do have a feeling uh, that the electric utility industry is not aware of what is coming down on it, both in social pressure and possibly in the, 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 the uh, instability that may hit it, the way instability has hit the European uh, utility industry, the European grid, a uh, very serious energy crisis in Europe, which has effects here. But the most important thing is there's been a wind drought in Europe, basically from April through the end of September. And the results of that are being felt across the world because of a new demand for natural gas as a substitute. But it also suggests nobody thought there hadn't been any such shortage of wind in 60 years. Uh, what happens if you apply that to the US with our huge dependence on wind? Uh, and uh, I, think it, 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 I think it's a wake up moment. I think right. it also points up the need for us to move ahead with an aggressive, viable nuclear program. Uh, there isn't anything else that will do the lifting. Uh, Dixie Lee Ray, who used to be head of the Atomic Energy Commission, which morphed into the Department of Energy, used to say, you can move a log with a billion fleas, but you better get an elephant if you want it done. Uh, nuclear power plugs are uh, elephants, and we need some of them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well said. We'll circle back with some of those thoughts. Uh, Jonathan Van, how are you, sir? Fantastic. Just like y'all, just enjoying good fall weather for the next week, maybe. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, well, glad, glad that you're here. Jonathan Van, for those that don't know him, uh, it's a... Uh, uh, you know, an executive at a company called Element 8, and he is in charge of an enterprise business development and innovation. And Element 8 is one of those next generation internet service providers, telecom service providers that is really changing the way things are done and providing all kinds of interesting offerings. And so we'll hear more about it. Looking forward to that. Uh, Jonathan happens to 
all the BS in business administration from the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, that makes Dr. Butler very happy because actually Jonathan is a disciple. And as he said earlier, before we logged on, Jonathan learned his swagger from Dr. Butler. <laughs> Yeah, that's there. all you need to know. Next thing you know, I'm going to be breaking out my guitar too. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Hey, the awesome back. swagger. Awesome, awesome yeah. swagger. Now uh, let me let me start with uh, with uh, you know sort of uh, what's going on in the world, and you know it it seems like we have all kinds of interesting uh, dichotomies and paradoxes happening. Uh, the country. You know, uh, it, it's uh, in this this whole notion of the great resignation. Uh, a significant chunk of the population doesn't want to go back to work as as is. You know that applies primarily to the hospitality and restaurant and food businesses. And it's really fascinating how this great resignation is also the notion that many folks folks, you know, sort of a contemporaries of Jonathan are really more interested in having a great quality of life, regardless of how much money they're making. And they're basically dropping out of work and starting new companies and leaving corporate America. And it's like something is incredibly interesting happening. And, and uh, you know, I've been uh, watching this with incredible... Um, Welcome to Bixby. Uh, Talk to me anytime by saying oh, that. Oh, 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 we got Dixie and I'm paying attention to what we're saying. Um, and anyway, and, and then farther than that, you know, it's really interesting to mix messages about inflation or not, the price of oil, you know, up and down, gasoline uh, up and down, or just dog market trading sideways. And then, you know, the whole conflict with China and in the Middle East and North Korea and what's going to happen with all that. So, so Johnny, what, what's your take on where are we? Uh, it seems like uh, lots of local politics, lots of international politics. We seem to be in, we seem to be in the brink of a, a shift here, um, John Butler. I think we have a renegotiation of the relationship between labor and market economists. I think what we've seen over the last 40 years, really since the 1970s, we had a rededication to the technology industry and to technology transfer and creating great, great companies. Along with that came two kinds of economies. Those people who were really engaged in what we call the technology company, therefore here's the Silicon Valley of the world, the Austin, Texas of the world, the 128 in Boston of the world. And along with that came the gig economy. And for the first time, we had a gig economy that was not bounded, if you will, with uh, with unions, uh, less likely to be unionized, more likely to be free thinking. And then we had the pandemic. And when the pandemic came, there was a mixture of, of politics, <clears throat> what we should do, and who was to blame. Well, all of a sudden, there was a revolution in worker attitude that was very, very different than any other revolution. Most revolutions were about, we're going we're gonna to march on the great industries and we demand more from the unions, we're gonna increase wages. This was a revolution in a change in pace and change of doing other things. And all of a sudden they were freed from their occupations and they are searching. Now I happen to think that this is, a, this is not necessarily linear. I mean, I don't think it would continue to happen. It might be curvilinear. That is, it's gonna start out as a great, great movement but then I think what will happen is that people will hatch on to two things, new companies that's being developed by themselves. I think the gig economy will come back stronger in the future. But more importantly, we right now have a revolution in new business models based on the technologies, new business models that came out as we talked about during the pandemic. How do you deliver food to people? How do you create automobiles that ride through places and pick up food rather than even delivering to yourself? But more importantly, how do you commercialize the gig economy and it's being done at an individual level? I think the politics are lost as to what to do. I, I think we haven't seen this since the Gill economists of, of earlier centuries. 
So we're living in unprecedented times when there are so many opportunities and people refuse to take those opportunities. Hmm. And it would be interesting to, to see how it goes and how it pans out. But it is a, right now, it is the, let's, it is a decade of innovation, the decade of small entrepreneurship, and a decade of people saying, freedom is self-employment, and let's have a go at it. Hmm. But I don't think that will last forever. Yeah, yeah. Llewellyn, what are your thoughts? Um, I'm, I'm awestruck, I don't know that I can follow John. Uh, I mean, what can man say? Maybe you could rearrange these things so I could come before him. Uh, <laughs> what is actually going on is indeed a revolution in employment. Uh, people stayed home, found out they rather liked it, found out they didn't get the rewards out of their jobs that they thought they ought to that they were led to believe. And basically, an ethic has been overturned. And that was the ethic that you get out of school, you go and you work very, very hard, and maybe you'll get some preferment, depending on what the work is. Now, if you, if you had a good education and you're in computer scientist, science, you'll probably do very well. If you are a very creative person and you have learned a skill in your education, the chances are you will start your own business or that option instead. But for many people, the jobs available are not much fun. They're urged on to greater productivity. They see the huge gulf between what executives are paid and what they are paid. And they've just had enough. They're not going to play that game anymore. Uh, the, gig the gig economy is real. I think the social network that surrounds all work needs to be updated so that people in the gig economy have a better shot at uh, social services, et cetera, are recognized, uh, are in the social security system and anything else they need to be in. And they need to have a situation where they can easily buy health insurance, uh, not as individuals, but as a group that kind of thing, and it's coming. I think we're going to see a lot of gig workers, uh, people who are happier, but that depends on your having a skill that lends itself to contracting, to yeah. part-time in several places, uh, and not everybody has those skills. Uh, there are going to be other changes. If we get the total flood of electric vehicles, which I am anticipating, an awful lot of automobile technicians are going to be out of work. Garages are going to fail, or they're going to have to go over to become charging stations or sell, I don't know, candy or something. Uh, big changes, but they're not dramatic. They're not overnight. They're incremental, but things mm -hmm. are changing. Globally, the situation is very disturbed. We have an energy crisis, which I think will continue in Europe, but it extends around the world. China is buying every, every spot of liquefied natural gas and pipeline gas through Russia that it can get its hands on. Um, Brazil is uh, impaired in its productivity because it cannot get enough gas. Uh, electricity production may be very low in Europe this winter because of a shortage of gas after the failure of the wind in the summer. There was a very bad wind summer for Europe lowest wind speeds in 60 years. And 60 years ago, only people at sea really cared about wind speeds. Mariners cared about them. Uh, nowadays, we all care about them because of generating electricity. The question is, if we can have that kind of adverse wind condition in Europe, uh, can we have it across the wind heavy parts of the United States, the Great Plains? Michigan, parts of Texas, a huge wind state. Uh, we do know that we get periodic wind droughts. Texas, for example, it tends to be somewhere between a week and 10 days a year. But if it goes on for months and months, the effect is huge. So we're going to have to look as we head towards decarbonization that we don't destabilize our electric system. And in the course of destabilizing that, we destabilize everything else because everything is dependent on electricity. Mm -hmm. There are solutions, but whether we have an administration that would have an ear to them 
We should, in my view, build, the government should build uh, a series of nuclear power plants because the energy density is so high, the amount of electricity is so high, and um, sell it on contract to the electric utilities and indeed sell the plants themselves on a build own transfer basis, well-known way of putting up big plants, but it has to be done expeditiously and done now, or we're going to have an unstable future and natural gas is not going to be removed from the mix. We are not going to go magically to a world of purely solar and wind and some hydro, uh, even if we get better batteries and better storage and hydrogen, Pleasant, present plans for hydrogen are that hydrogen will be produced from the slack time in wind. Well, if the wind isn't there, you won't have the hydrogen. That's not really a solution. Right. So I think we need a large, stable base of electric production. And the only thing we know at the moment that doesn't adversely affect the environment in an egregious way is, so, is nuclear. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, well, well said. So, Jonathan, uh, interested in your perspective, you are an executive in a small company uh, that is uh, next gen, uh, new technologies. Uh, you have been impacted by COVID a little bit. I would, I would imagine, love, love to get your feedback, that the, the COVID uh, year was maybe an acceleration of business year for digitalization. Um, love to hear your take on that. And Curious, how is business looking in 2021 as we're closing the year and entering 2022? Are things up or down or steady? Or what's your take on, on the opportunities for your company? Sure, yeah. No, I think riffing on what everyone else said, the, this entire year has been a, an opportunity for what I call anic data. So there's high level headlines, macro trends. And then I always think about what's the microcosm. So an example, we're talking about energy and we had the winter storm in February. And I think to myself, do I want a battery generator, a diesel generator, different kinds of opportunities to go independent? And I'd say, well, I like my diesel generator because it goes 24 seven, I can always refill it. It's not clean but uh, the need for something that's reliable and consistent is still there. And then you can layer things on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, related to COVID, yeah, we've seen it macro and micro. We've had to manage our office. We just moved into our headquarters last year. And then like many of the business owners uh, had to go into hybrid or no office structure. Uh, we had our operating team all out in the field, getting, te getting tested regularly because they were going into homes. And it was definitely something we still manage today. We still manage how people feel, uh, making sure people take care of themselves, especially in a fast growing business. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone actually is overworking despite, you know, whether they've had long COVID or different kinds of things. Boots on the ground has been, uh, it's been a little challenging, but definitely an opportunity where everyone has made, I would say, transformative life decisions, whether that's breaking up, getting divorced, getting a new job or quitting. You know, you, so those are like the microcosm mm -hmm. data points that underpin some of these macro pieces. And mm -hmm. of course, for our business, it's great because I think, as they've said, that five-year pull, even almost seven-year pull of digitization across cities, across your what we call the enterprise home, mm -hmm. uh, we'll see a 200x in business over the next year. Just the demand is off the charts. And that's not and that's in the United States, and that doesn't include global demand. Mm -hmm. So there you have it, Llewellyn, 200% growth. What do you think? Oh, 200x growth. Sorry. Oh, not 200x, 200x. So 20,000%. 20,000%. Uh, I think that um, Jonathan's in a lot better place than I am. I mean, journalists. Uh, we don't Pretty, get we do that okay. kind of growth. Our productivity goes up marginally over 50 year periods. <laughs> Jonathan, we're just lucky. Yeah. Jonathan, your 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 enterprise sound eerie like my class that you had from me. Um, yeah. You know, there's a lot of creative destruction happening right now. And it's like you said, like there's <clears throat> there's a lot of things that are changing, right? And that doesn't come without a lot of pain, right? So you're talking about autonomous vehicles, the change of like real estate you know we see malls getting demolished whether they'll be repurposed for edge data centers or something like that you know there's a lot of transfer transformation happening you know jonathan i was thinking back 
you know, back when you were in school here, I did have a, a student, I don't think it was you, who, who their, their project was what's going on now with the Samsung Fold. They were working on mm -hmm. a technology that would allow a, a telephone to emerge into a tablet with absolutely, was That's that right. your, was that your product? That wasn't my product, but that was the same exact year. Yeah, I remember. I was just looking it up yesterday, actually. And, um, and, and he was a student in engineering, and he brought that project to my class. And now, of course, they have the fold, the fold uh, telephone. Uh, yeah. That might have come out of my class. But what I want to ask you is this. Uh, we have talked a lot about business models. And going in the future, how do you see the development of business models from the new technologies? That is, if you look at the, I do the CNBC new technologies, right? What are the companies that would define the future in your view? What, what do you see in, in the technologies at Enterprise BND and Innovation at EA? What's, what's it, what excites you about the technologies that you see? Yeah, I guess there's, that's two different questions. One is the businesses that are exciting and two is the technologies because they, they sometimes go uh, they sometimes go hand in hand and a lot of times they don't. I mean, we've seen so I think there's been a everyone's an investor this year, whether they're on Robinhood or something else speculating. We've seen there are great products like Peloton who may not be good businesses, great technologies. People love them, but uh, bad businesses. I think on the business front and we've seen it from the hyperscale companies, the ones that can figure out to, how to get some subscription revenue. Um in any way or format, whether that's, and we see that in energy and we see that in our business, which is where the original SaaS, right? We sell, I, I joke that we sell air, right? Um, and so if you can overlay some subscription business on top of all of the, the opportunities, we've seen so much acceleration that's made possible based on that, that the, it's, it's hard to argue that you, they won't be able to deploy more capital to increase their moats over time. Um, on the technology front, there's so much happening, at least I can only speak for the telecom space that we see. Um, it's here, like whether it's 10G or 100G to the consumer, it's here now, like anything else, it'll, it'll take probably three years for all the applications that sit on top of it to make it worthwhile for the consumer. Um, but there's definitely so much on the consumer side that's transforming. We've seen um, social networks spring up. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about crypto or Web3 and what that could change. Um, and less so on like the financialization and more so just on how people behave. I mean, we see, I, I see people's behavior change when they get into that community in a good way um, because it makes everyone an owner. And so I think more than anything, that, that reorganization that's happening, we're always actively monitoring both both locally as well as internationally for kind of the transition that's happening. We just know that we're, we're in the eye of the storm at this very moment. Yeah, yeah. The one, the one business that it is exciting to me that I, to, to piggyback on that is I am mesmerized and fascinated, and I don't know why Llewellyn is not doing it, is crypto mining. You, you go online, you buy a couple of servers, you turn them on in your house, plug, you know, have internet access, you have your electric deal and, 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 you know, pretty soon you're generating cryptocurrency and you're a millionaire. And it's just fascinating to me that this is, I mean, it is, it's just the tip of the ice or what's going on with cryptocurrencies. And, uh, you know, my kids are in their twenties and, you know, th their, their crypto portfolios are starting to make a serious attack into my dollar portfolio. <laughs> And I'm like, what's going on? So crypto mining, I don't know if you have any any customers like that, Jonathan, that you're doing uh, internet services for, but the, we, they seem yeah. to be all over the place. It's an inevitability. I, this is actually a question for, for, for Doc, I call him Dr. Bell, we call him Johnny for, for this case, <laughs> but uh, how long can you go into a class before it devolves into a crypto discussion? It is very interesting because I guess we had a discussion about the guy who was deep into it and he lost his cell phone. And it was all of his money was on his cell phone. Oh, yeah. So he was at the city dump, going through the city dump, trying to find his cell phone to reclaim <laughs> all of his wealth. I think what's happening, uh, we have, I have kids uh, doing crypto today. 
I think that block blockchain would be a huge, huge improvement. And everything is based on trust. <laughs> I mean, the dollar bill is what in, in God we trust. It's just there. Mm -hmm. So as the trust networks evolve, and then you begin to purchase stuff, it would be very, very interesting. Now, for us who remember the hippies, I can remember when they were they were purchasing stuff on a lot of different kind of stuff that was not currency. So it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it's always in the conversation. I gotta drink something here. <laughs> yeah. Sure, no worries. I think what's what's fascinating yeah. is the it's 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 asked the dumb question, which is what's money? It's in a lot of 2020 has been re-asking a lot of first principle questions about our institutions, about money, what are these things at, at a fundamental basis? And it's kind of, everyone has gone from the ground up to rethink what that actually is. It's, it's funny that we're even visiting this at all. Well, this is, uh, this is totally fascinating. Uh, and I want to ask uh, Jonathan how he sees the future for what are called the unbanked. There are 41 million mm -hmm. Americans who do not have bank accounts, let alone crypto accounts. Uh, they're not very sophisticated. They're often uh, uh, poorly educated. Sometimes they're immigrants. Um, and they're in a predicament. I just made a short trip down to Florida and back, and everything involved the computer, buying the ticket, changing the ticket, uh, riding in the Uber, uh, checking in the hotel. All of those required a credit card. They mm -hmm. required uh, electronic money, in short. Mm -hmm. uh, if I had no credit card, I don't know how I'd have done it. I would have had to go to the airport to buy the ticket. Uh, taxis are almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. I didn't see one in Florida. So I don't know how I would have gotten to the meeting. Uh, I tell you that if you lose your wallet and you try and check into a hotel, you are treated as some strange creature that's happened to me in San Francisco quite some time ago. And I had to posit I'd get a some money sent from mm -hmm. my office by American, by, uh, by uh, some money transfer system. And they looked on me as somebody who was deeply suspicious and gave me a little lecture that, okay, my hotel bill would be covered, but I dare not sign any checks, uh, mm -hmm. pay cash for your drinks. For your, uh, so I just wonder about that 41 million people. Now, normally if you have a market that size, because anytime you have a large group of people, they are a market. Mm -hmm. Something can be sold and is being sold to them. They have economic power of some kind. Uh, whether we're going to see something come out of cryptocurrency, which will in fact take care of them without them having huge uh, technological skills, understanding mm -hmm. data mining and uh, well, blockchain, et cetera. Sure. Yeah, one thing, uh, funny funny story first, then, then also that kind of plays into this. So yesterday I was trying to do something in the crypto world and I didn't have enough currency in my wallet and it actually stopped me. And it made me think of a, a little bit Black Mirror situation um, where we talked about microtransactions, right? You, you pay with this, even if it's 0. 0.00001 penny. Um, but if you don't have it, you know, you can't open the door to the bathroom as an example. And it was just this funny, weird, uh, dystopian thought uh, when that happened to me, just trying to transfer some currency. But on the second note, it doesn't have to be through crypto. I think PayPal, Venmo, if these, if the unbanked have a, a phone, then they can have a wallet. And if they have a Venmo wallet, and as an example, like even when I go tip my valet, I don't carry cash anymore. I haven't carried cash for about five years. Um, that works pretty much everywhere except certain hotels. Um, and if they have a Venmo account, they have a wallet. And I think more and more, whether it's through payroll or some of the gig economy, they're now distributing those payments into those wallets. So they don't necessarily need a bank account. They just need a mobile phone and a wallet. And I don't know what the updated numbers are, but I have a feeling the more I talk to contractors and anyone else, they, they, have, they may not have a bank account, but they have a wallet. And then those, those companies are now enabling different sorts of underwriting. So whether that's like payroll advances, so you don't have to do payroll uh, to go to a payday lender or the opportunity to have credit underwritten against your wallet deposit. There's this new transformation that's happening via wallets. It can be through crypto, but even traditional finance companies are getting into uh, solving that problem finally. 
Thank you. You know, the question becomes, what would be the standard? So before they went to, uh, when we had the gold standard in in America, and then they went down to uh, <clears throat> to the islands off of Florida and created the National Bank, and the standard is gold. So uh, in addition to the cryptocurrency that's going on, there's also people buying physical gold. I mean, mm -hmm. where do you put $3 million worth of physical gold? Do you bury it? Or what happens? So my question is, uh, is for the crypto uh, currency stuff, what's the, what's the, what's the standard? What I, uh, what I can tell you based on what I see is, and I always joke that I just pay attention to what teenagers look at and I, you know, they don't even have a concept of gold. I mean, they know gold, but whether it's a store of value versus a jewel, piece of jewelry is very different. They assume Bitcoin's digital gold. And so for the next 10, 20 years, that will, at least to them, be their store of value, as far as I can tell. It, it's, it may not be the fastest moving. It may mm -hmm. not be the most uh, exciting cryptocurrency today, but, or even the most functional, but it's the most... What, what I say Bitcoin is to the community is it the value of it is in it not changing. Literally, no one changes it. There are no versions of it where they want to change it. And that is the value of it. Whereas every other project, it's an open source software community. And they're constantly changing, trying to evolve. And Ethereum just released their recent move from proof of work to proof of stake. And yeah. that's not something that would happen with Bitcoin. Bitcoin's just, it just is. We can define it. We change it, whether it's a bull or bear market, but the system itself doesn't really care. Humans kind of impart, you know, our, our feelings on it. Yeah, well, you know, Jonathan, after the Civil War, we had every bank had their own currency. Many cities, every city had their own currency. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the Confederate States had their own currency. So what is money, as you asked, is a, is a legitimate question. Uh, barter, of course, was based on the movement of things, of, of goods, not necessarily uh, services per se, but some things were bartered. So I, think, I don't know if we're entering uh, a situation where, you know, if, if there's no standardization of money and where everybody have their own currency, and the question is, what's the cross-fertilization as we share and try to do things, not only in our own city, so to speak, but also across the world? So I can imagine that back in the day, as they say, as my kids like to say, a bank could have their own currency. They could literally mm -hmm. issue their own currency. But but I'm going to ask it, Llewellyn. Can I? Can I? I'm going to ask Llewellyn, my my, uh, my my good friend of, of of history. Do you see the similarities between uh, uh, what is money today versus what is money uh, years back? Uh, can I just say something here? Yeah. Johnny, isn't it the case that when banks were issuing their own currency, which they did all over the world, that currency was tied to gold. There was some relationship to something positive. The sense one gets if one's not in the crypto world, which I am not, uh, is what is this tied to? What scarcity. physical thing scarcity. can I beg your pardon? The scarcity. There it's are only 20... There are only 21 million Bitcoins. That will ever be issued. That, yeah. It's on a schedule, but that is the So that it's, is a, it's, the a, gold it's a limited, standard. it's a limited printing. It's done. It's 21 million. There could be a Bitcoin 2.0 or Bitcoin 3, but Bitcoin will be only 21 million of them. Uh, and how does that uh, I'm really curious, yeah. How does that work in relation to the fiat currencies? So, so supply and demand. No, so when you say in relation to fiat currencies, in what relationship are you trying to, I guess, ask about? Well, exactly that. What is the value as uh, to value to value? What is one Bitcoin's value in dollars or one dollar's value in Bitcoins or thousand dollars value in Bitcoins? Our, most of our systems work on the fiat currency. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not opposed Still to Still does, changing. yeah, no. I, I, I'm not I, opposed to them changing, but if you have a dual system, how, for example, will the IRS collect its taxes? And uh, the, there are things that are going to be very difficult adjustments um, as we move from, you haven't carried money for five years, 
but I don't know how you tip a parking lot attendant or what you give to a beggar on the street, um, uh, that kind of thing. I suggest you might want to carry a little bit of money, although I have no doubt that we will see the end of money uh, as we have known it, paper folding money. But whether it'll be Bitcoin, I have no idea. Uh, I'm probable, but uh, not certain. Right, Bitcoin is only, it's only for online services, so it's not for typical, it's for so, online. So, so Llewellyn, there's the graph right now, stock market, one Bitcoin, $66,000 per, big, per Bitcoin. And there will only be 21 million of them issued. That is a relation today, right? Yeah, uh, yeah but that doesn't answer Llewellyn's question about right. what is the relative value to the relative value. In other words, if all well, of it's a like, sudden, it's like it's like art, it's like anything. Yeah, anything it's like art, right? Well, but I, I can convert know. I can convert art to dollars. So 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 Llewellyn is asking if all of a sudden. I have to convert my my money to dollars. Uh, what's the, what's the standard? What's what's the conversion rate? Do I pay a uh, a back end load? Uh, how does that work? You can sell it on an exchange and get it just like any other okay. currency, okay. right? Yeah. There's some exchange rate, and there's a limited. You know, there's almost no fee, uh, depending on the time. That that would be the downside. Is you can move any large or small amount, similar like, actually very dissimilar to gold, right? If I wanted to move, you know, $30 million worth of gold and take a truck and security and all the costs that, per, you know, are tied yes. to that versus- I, th you know, I think that's the best explanation. It's like, I look at my guitars and I said, wow, I got 12 guitars. Mm -hmm. And the question is who wants to buy one? And then mm -hmm. it, and it converts to, that's the way I explain it. And that's the way I see it. It's, it's the, much thing like about, having art. the thing about gold is nobody's actually had the gold in their house, the gold mm -hmm. is in some repository somewhere, but mm -hmm. you have title to it. And it is the title which changes hands, not physical gold. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in the same way you don't take a piece of land with you, uh, you have title to the land and it mm -hmm. stays where it always has been. Um, it, it's just a very interesting, I don't mean to be argumentative about no, it, no, no, no. because the future is coming and I'm out of step with it, but nonetheless, it is extremely interesting. But yeah, I can see all sorts of awkwardnesses and difficulties mm -hmm. and the possibility that you can have a crash. We have seen Bitcoin crash mm -hmm. and it couldn't crash again. I don't know why or what would trigger the crash, but uh, there you are. I, I would like right. to, uh, to ask yeah, in this future world that you see, which we don't mention, I think, enough on this broadcast, and that is the role of new materials. Um, I was just reading up on how we might reduce the pollution from cement. And one way is to put uh, graphene in the cement so it gets stronger and you need less of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Graphene always comes up because it's a sort of cutting edge material. Uh, there's a roadway in Yorkshire in England which is being paved partly in graphene. There's a sheet of graphene in the roadway which could revolutionize roads if it works uh, if we can use less cement in concrete and less concrete because we have a stronger product we have made huge changes at some point you can do everything uh, in 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 the in the world of, um, of theor theory and in a sense things you cannot see are theoretical uh, but we also have to do physical things we have to farm we have to eat we have to travel uh, and of course, we have to clean up the environment. And uh, uh, a big part of cleaning the environment will be new materials, in my view. Yeah, I think, a, I think and, and, and what, what we're saying here is how, how, how are they all interrelated as we move through the world? And I, I think that um, when we look at material science and we look at a lot of things that can be traded, you know, and, and we look at a lot of artwork that's sitting somewhere that's worth millions of dollars. And, and I think that, uh, Llewellyn, when you say, what's the relationship between material science and where we're going in the future? That's certainly what people are looking at now in terms of the patent that's been produced and those kinds of things. The, the value of art is based on social judgments of its value. It's right. a very subjective judgment. Uh, if you're looking at uh, something more positive, like 
like a farm, uh, that's a very different judgment. If you're looking mm -hmm. at gold, uh, it is somewhat, it's used for jewelry and it's used in, in science, but it's, its value is far in uh, excess of its use. It's a social judgment uh, mm -hmm. and has been down through history, yes. but, it, but Just it's not essential. To touch on what you're talking about with new materials, kind of our ability to um, kind of press, you know, press in with the new age. I think this is actually where government's role, I think, is more interesting is how do they incentivize those things, like whether it's through those carbon taxes or make, you know, we've seen the, the push that companies have had to remote work, which is also immediately dumped out a large <laughs> footprint of carbon. Um, as you know, some of the largest consulting firms turned a uh, flight, you know, weekly flight there and back into Zoom calls. Uh, I have friends at EY who said, you know, they've they've they can out now calculate how much they've saved in carbon just mm -hmm. doing that transition. And these companies are doing so, but I still think the accounting of it is a is a true challenge. And I think um, I think recently I talked to someone who was at the G20. They released an accounting paper that mentioned. In our current accounting practices, we actually cannot deploy the things that we want to do um, to, to build nuclear plants, to deploy certain scales of energy. And I think, just think that's interesting because GAP wasn't always GAP and there are changes and we forget that these are things that we created as humans. Like accounting is a technology that we can also change regulation huh. and accounting standards to, to spur those things. Yep. Yeah. Remember, Jonathan, it's finance that allows us to look into the future. Mm -hmm. Counting is real numbers, and finance is projections. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let, me, yeah I like let, let me let me let me let me jump in and change something. So again, remember that we we are very focused here on the digital transformations that are happening, and and we track you know telecom and smart cities and smart energy and smart buildings and the like. And, and one of the key things on the building blocks uh, is obviously communications, network infrastructure and so on, which is what Jonathan's company does for a living. And, and I remind you all that in, in that journey of digitalization, taking anything analog like a glass and a window and a door in a house and, and now turning that into a connected device, a connected element that needs an IP address uh, IPv4 uh, had only 4.3 billion addresses and we ran out of it a few years ago. And IPv6 was created, which has 340 trillion addresses. Uh, and so it's gonna, it's gonna last a little long, but when you think about every transaction potentially having an IP address, we will probably run out in IPv6 and we'll have to go to IPv8. Jonathan, what, what do you think is happening in terms of IoT and tracking of devices and, net, and the networks and the throughput? Where, where, give us a sense for how fast is that all growing? You know, what's funny is one of my first investments when I came out of college was in a, in a company called Duello. They did um, smart apartments, so the actual full-on deployment, servicing, and operations of those things. And they just got acquired today by another company. And so it's, it was interesting because five years ago, there was, I think, similar to when smart cities were hot. They were the first, the first peak. And then we hit the Trophic Star over the past mm -hmm. five years, basically. And I think there's been a resurgence, right? As, digit mm -hmm. as, as digitization takes hold, both in the cities as well as in our homes, right? We have like 30 plus, on average, 30 plus connected devices. Yep. We now know it can make a difference. Every house in my neighborhood is optimized, probably based on some of the work that happened at Mueller and other places. Um, and we know that works. If you can have automation, it works. Just pe no one, no one wants to manage it. If you can automate it, that's perfect. And so there's only an uptrend where everything has a chip that's connected. And, and I mean, I joke that I actually miss the days when things weren't connected or had compute because whether it's your car getting fixed and you can't just bring it to the mechanic, you have to bring it to your dealership with their software. It has pros and cons, right? Like I didn't want to have a smart faucet because one day it just goes out. I, you know, I can't even turn the thing on. Right. Um, but but we see it only increasing in every in every fashion. The question is, people are trying to bear hug it. You know, what do we? What's the right spectrum to use? Who's going to manage it? Our team, someone else. 
Mm-hmm. I think everyone's still trying to answer that question. We, we believe the managed Wi-Fi model is going to end up working for a lot of people, um, but we're, we'll see. Right. Do, do you think, Jonathan, that there are parameters that people stop at, that they just don't want any more of this or that? Um, what I, you know, what you, know, hmm? you know, the Concord was a failure, really. People really didn't want to go to Europe. Uh, in three hours, uh, uh, it didn't mean that much. It meant a little bit to a few self-important people. I know because I wrote it three times. Um, uh, the, 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 there are sort of things when people don't want more of something, even though it's there and available. Uh, whenever, I, whenever I write anything about smart cities, which I've done quite a bit, I get a bunch of letters from my readers about walkability and safety. They don't care that the traffic is going to flow better, that the ambulances are going to come faster, that the sewage is going to be uh, better treated. They want to know where they can go safely for a walk and will it be nice to stroll down the streets and look in the windows. Uh, And that's the human interaction with the accelerated uh, uh, speed of technology, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when I when I see all the friction that occurs, uh, whether it's like the smart faucets or whatever that's happening in the world, I think that's technology done poorly. When technology is done well, it should feel like magic. I mean, I think about every day that we're on this call, I'm basically teleporting to you and you're teleporting to me every day. It's my window into the into the world. Um, and if we looked at that in sci-fi world, that'd be very different. And so when it's done well, I think it's, it's only additive, but mm-hmm. a lot of technology is not done that well. And in fact, very unfriendly to consumers, unfriendly to humans. Well yeah. said, of course, that, the magic that we all take for granted is electricity. Now shut up. Yeah. So, so let, let me follow that up with something, Jonathan. I wanted to get your take on it being a, a you know, a, a next generation thought leader and and, and working in a space that is so fundamental to the digitalization of everything that we're trying to do. Uh, you're familiar with Facebook and you're, I'm sure, mm-hmm. incredibly familiar with the, their name change to Meta and the big bet that they, he, Zuckerberg mm-hmm. is making on virtual reality as the next user interface and all the video that will be traveling through your network <laughs> and how many gigabytes per second he will require. Yeah. Uh, give oh, yeah. us a sense of that world. What, Zuckerberg is making a huge bet. What is he betting on? What does that world look like <laughs> five years from now? <laughs> five years from now? I, I hope it doesn't look like uh, just all of us in headsets. But I will say the number of people who have used a Quest 2 have said it's transformative. They only use it for a few things. But we've seen people keep these headsets on for 60 minutes plus, which is a long time. I don't, I don't think the world's going full VR. But in a world where you can stream content, go AR, whether it's glasses or whatever that form factor is, I, I can't imagine a world that's not that way. I mean, I'll love it, but it's hard to imagine a world where that's not the case. And second, I don't know if I necessarily love the change, but what I do know is I don't bet against a founder, especially someone who's like 35, I think, um, still in their prime, looking to go for another decade of, you know, he, he, he could have shut down like so we've had an era during COVID where a lot of the big tech CEOs stepped down made a transition and he's saying I'm doubling down and whatever wherever that takes me whether that's to against Congress or against different things he's saying I'm willing to make a company-wide bet and so I don't bet against that trend but um, I don't imagine the next five years is us in in headsets per se. I, I, re- I recall this movie and, I, and I'll let uh, Johnny chime in but I recall this movie by Arnold Schwarzenegger called Total Recall when he takes a, a, a vacation to Mars and goes into a place that sells vacations and you don't go anywhere. You pay them and then you put the goggles on and you, and you go on vacation. Well, you know, we can go back to the Jetsons. Uh, Jonathan, when I was a kid, we had a television program called mm-hmm. the Jetson and everything, everything was, uh, it was all futuristic, but now that futuristic is here. They had cell phones, but there were no cell phones. They were flying around in in, uh, in, in Uber in Uber kind of cars. All of that is coming. So, Jonathan, I like your idea about imagining the future. I mean, can you imagine a world 
where you just go up to space for three seconds and pay $10 million to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, it's crazy to think that what's I mean, possible Somebody today. just paid $10 million, $100 million, whatever it was, to fly up in space for a minute. Yeah. So the question, as we always say in the quick look, is, is there a market for it? <laughs> right, yeah. Right. Well, yeah. I, I, I can tell you that, that I've done it digitally at NASA with the goggles, and it's incredible, but no, I wouldn't. <laughs> but <because laughs> it's relative. I didn't get in on Bitcoin at the beginning. No, I think, I think that's the magic of technology is if you can make that experience, not $10 million, but $10, right? Is right. Can, if you could actually bring that entire experience. And there's, there's more. I, I think I do think VR is a ten, on a ten year window, not a five year window. I think that's, in a way, Facebook made a bet five years ago when they bought Oculus that that would be a big transition, and that mm -hmm. is in fact not what happened over five years. It is in fact a fifteen year transition if if it if it's a transition at all. Right, right. Yeah, no, I think I think it, it will be a you know an alternative universe for a while. But you're absolutely right that you know AR, uh, you know, uh, as you know, for the training, for the maintenance, for the repair guy, for me having the map in my glasses instead of having to look at my map in my phone, for all kinds of things that could can be layover reality. You know, I can see that coming. And you know, the Google glasses that were way too early when they came out. Uh, at some point, that's going to start happening. And it'll be interesting to see, again, where does bandwidth and connectivity go? Because none of it, work, none of it works without electricity and without connectivity. And, and so it's really fascinating to me, the building blocks of, you know, 100 gigabits per second and a, and a million gigabits per second on fiber and where 5G delivers today and 6G is being drawn up to deliver 10x, uh, 10 times what 5G does. And... And so, you know, it, it's, you know, when you started this company, uh, just again, to close on, on you guys, uh, you know, the, the, the components and the elements of the technology were pretty much the same. The, you know, nothing has really changed much in architecture. Maybe a lot of things have changed on cybersecurity and the schemas of cybersecurity. But do you see any quantum leaping coming up soon as we, you know, get in the verge of quantum computing and, Everybody having a mobile phone and mobility driving everything we do. Do you see yeah, it in, in the network yeah. business changes, significant changes? We we have some things, is all I can say. But I would say that at an architectural level, things will change. And I think the future that was, I think, has been talked about for about twenty to thirty years. And we talked to teams at Microsoft Research and others, mm -hmm. where the dream of a streaming device. So you should have a piece of glass. What's a, what amounts to a piece of glass, what amounts to a Chromebook, whether you're in India, Africa, or here, and you have the right connectivity, you should be able to stream high performance compute applications. So right. we see that at the edges today where people are just doing something as simple as rewriting Chrome, right? Chrome is something where if you have a hundred tabs open, you basically crash your computer. And right. now they can stream it on a, what's a, what amounts to a Chromebook and you end up with a high performance cloud computer on your laptop streamed. And right. so over time, you'll find, you know, no one's, I don't know if everyone's gonna have a quantum computer in their hands. We have AI chips in our hands today, mm -hmm. but you, as we get into more managed hyperscale cloud, whether that's at the edge or on the cloud, um, we, the end all be all dream is everyone has a simple, cheap, accessible device, just like uh, not even pixels, even cheaper devices. And mm -hmm. you can stream every most, the most powerful applications on the planet but through a commodity device. Yeah. Jonathan, let me ask you this. Uh, you know, cloud to me is a good old server. How do you mm -hmm. see cloud cloud architecture in the future? Uh, there will be cloud architects everywhere. And uh, how do you see that? It's, it'll be a huge, huge business. And then of course the hacking would go up. So how mm -hmm. do you see uh, so, the internet of things related to the development of, of yeah, cloud? Yeah, the biggest, sure. Yeah, the biggest, the biggest change I think coming in over the next few years is just pure decentralization. That's a word that people use in crypto, but even in cloud related edge services, you, you end up having a managed server, right? Whether that's at the neighborhood level, at the home level, and even at the enterprise level. 
And if you can isolate those things, so an example is we look at our network and we do cybersecurity. If we can isolate things onto that server instead of hitting all the way back to the cloud, so it's not a system level issue, it's something that we see as a way to manage it. But ultimately, this is a system where you have distributed nodes. And in fact, it's not centrally managed. You in fact need AI level compute and orchestration. So that's self-orchestrating and making decisions to isolate attacks, to handle automations. It's not necessarily something that, you know, you have your NOC or your SOC necessarily manually doing anything to the network. In fact, your job is to write the code to manage the that, that, the, that the AI manages. Right, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. Uh, Jonathan, you know, we're coming here to an end and I'm curious, uh, you know, what 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 what's your favorite type of customer and in 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 you know and I also want to thank you for being a Cedar member you know Texas State uh, got lucky enough to meet Jonathan and the team and 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 we came to terms and we're collaborating and working together and Jonathan is going to be uh, joining us in in December a 9th and we're having our big event launching our smart networks uh, lab that. Element Eight actually manages on behalf of Texas State Cedar. Uh, what 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 is your favorite kind of customer type? Uh, where do you see growth for the company? Let's say in Texas. Sure. Yeah. We we predominantly do residential, so we believe in the enterprise home. But what's funny is we will we will and want to work with a lot of large enterprises. We do municipal level deployments. Um, we've worked with like the city of Tulsa and others. And so we want, if you have a smart city deployment happening, we want to be able to be your partner of choice, um, engineering the solution, getting the connectivity in place and also future proofing. So we talk on the residential side, if you have connections to HOAs or community level master planned uh, or master plan communities, we love working at that level because it allows us to engineer the perfect network um, and a future proof network. And then any enterprises or city level deployments, we love we love hard things and we love people who want to push the boundaries of what's possible. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in, in a world of, uh, un, it seems like unlimited content, you know, Netflix, Hulu, you know, Peacock, Paramount plus, you name it. There is another, you know, mechanism, Apple plus, you know, prime Amazon prime uh, on and on and on. Uh, I, I envision in a dream of a world that you kind of alluded to, and I'm wondering what this strikes you. I, I, I remember writing uh, the elements of the, the how of the video would be the ultimate application for a lifetime. And I envision uh, Llewellyn and John watching games with their grandkids, and then they're broadcasting live every activity uh, so for me to watch also, and I can pay, you know, a few dollars to see the, the church thing that they went to or the wedding that they went to or the whatever that they went to. Do you, do you see that coming? I think that's possible, right? Yeah, so it's funny because my fiance is a full-time blogger and influencer. So we, we already do that. We have, I have friends who basically live uh, a giant televised life in mm -hmm. a way. Um, and so it, it's, it's kind of already here. It's just not as widespread as people think. And I think yeah. that's where, that's why I'm always looking at the edges where uh, people are doing this full time. Basically. Well, what, 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 I, what I would like to do as a, as a customer, right, is I would like to say, look, I want to watch the Pop Warner games around, uh, it, you know, uh, uh, Chicago uh, mm -hmm. to see, the, you know, how the Pop Warner games in Chicago are managed versus the Pop Warner games in Austin. And, and I just want to, you know, can I, can I subscribe to see a few of them, right? Kind of like, where do we're, I go for that? Always, yeah, you know, no, how we're, much we're would it talking cost about me? That, yeah, we talk about that stuff all the time internally is restructuring of the bundle. You know, things are coming up and there's yeah. an opportunity to, to unleash and bring that and package it for the customer in a way that's, you know, more personal. Honestly, the, the two biggest trends we see that's important is decentralization just across mm -hmm. the board. And you see that with people, with institutions, and with technologies. And then the second is personalization. So that's where I think, I'm actually surprised we didn't talk about AI at all, which is probably one of the largest underpinnings of everything that's about to happen. Yep. Um, that, that will enable higher personalization, right? We don't even remember a life before Google. 
And I don't think we'll remember a life after we have AI somewhat figured out enough for a consumer for it to be good, right? If Siri actually worked, it would be a dream, but we're not there yet. I agree. I agree. Well, <clears throat> in, in looking at the clock, unfortunately, we, we, we're run out of time. I just want to thank you for being with us today. Look forward to our journey at Texas State. Look forward to seeing you soon. And uh, thank you for being here with us, John and, and Llewellyn. Any final thoughts? Uh, well, Jonathan, I'm proud of you. I know you got a you got a perfect John Sibley Butler story from my class, but I'm yeah. proud of you. Hook them horns and uh, and continue to do great things and and re remember Schumpeter. Yes, sir. Remember Schumpeter, and uh, it's so good to see you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you've been one of our most fascinating guests, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Thank I'm you very glad much. to see you've overcome Appreciate your you. education. <laughs> <laughs> um, negative influences on in, when growing up. But I would expand for everyone the concepts of what is technology. I think a great piece of technology is the aeroplane. Uh, you know, technology is just not uh, uh, electronic. It's got so many aspects and it's all moving. Uh, we're off with a lot of help from computers, but it's all on the move. Materials and their applications. So we're going to see a very different world, uh, some of which will be virtual, but a lot of the physical aspects like the small electric aircraft, which might take us across town, et cetera, these things are coming. Thanks Absolutely. so much for joining us today, Jonathan. You're really Absolutely. wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you all. Thank you, Jonathan. Johnny, take us away with some music. I'm going down to the Greyhound station. Gonna get a ticket to ride. I'm gonna find that lady, two or three kids, and sit down by her side. Right till the sun comes up and down, round about two or three times. Smoke a cigarette on the back seat. Try out songs on the people I meet. And get along with it all. <laughs> all Good right. To see Excellent. Excellent. All right. Take care. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.